I remember when I emigrated from the UK to Australia. It was the very first time that I had a one-way air ticket, a ticket which was for a trip to somewhere with no consideration of when I was going back. Just me and my wife, Melanie, this was before children, uh, on one side of the barrier, leaving all our family and friends on the other side. It was actually quite emotional because we sort of, we hugged and cried on the other side of the barrier when no one was there after we'd been brave and gone through and said, oh my God, what have we done? Basically, it was a big trip into the unknown, driven by a work opportunity and our own sense of adventure and sort of brave willingness to give it a go. Today, we're going to talk about someone who relocated to live in another country to learn the secrets of the people living there. Person is author and journalist Adaranan Finn, and his journey became his first book, Running with the Kenyans. Hi, and welcome to Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review books written for runners, about runners, and by runners to help you decide if you would like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help keep you motivated about your own running, or maybe just inspire you to try something new or different. My name's Alan, and with my co-host Liz, we're going to chat about the book Running with the Kenyans by Adaranand Finn. Adaranand discovered a talent for running at a young age, but like many kids in sport, ended up getting distracted along the way and not realizing his potential. He continued to run in adulthood, but never really pushed his limits due to family obligations with three young kids. As the world is watching Kenyan athletes rise to the top and sweep the podiums of many major races, Adaranand wonders what their secret is. With the approval of his wife, they moved their three young kids to Kenya for six months so that Adaranand can train with the best runners in the world. This book is divided into 25 chapters with each one including a piece of Adaranan's bigger story involving his own running and trying to find the Kenyan running secret, and some side stories about people that Adaranand meets along the way. Now a little bit about Adaranand. Adaranand Finn is an assistant production editor for The Guardian newspaper in the, in the UK, freelance writer and author of three award-winning books, Running with the Kenyans, Discovering the Secrets of the Fastest People on Earth, which is the book we're talking about today, and Adaranand's first book. The Way of the Runner, which talks about Japanese obsessive running culture, and Rise of the Ultra Runners, a journey to the edge of human endurance. Adaranand also organizes running and writing retreats, which you can find at his website, wayoftherunner.com. He also has a podcast by the same name. Adaranand is an accomplished runner and writes from a runner's perspective, by the way, we also covered another one of Adaranan's books called Rise of the Ultra Runner, which was his third book. Uh, so you can go listen to that in, in one of the previous episodes. And we actually interviewed Adaranan about that one. So unfortunately, today we didn't get Adaranan uh, to come on for the for his first book because he was... Uh, he was a little busy with his other projects, I guess. Yeah, you know. basically, people will realize now that um, he's just put out a, a rec or recently put out a podcast with um, Eliud Kipchoge. So he's mm -hmm. busy uh, working hard trying to get his interview with Eliud Kipchoge and publish that. And just at the time that we were asking him to come on and talk with us about about um, about running with the Kenyans, so um, we decided yeah. we'd just go ahead and make the podcast kind of without him as he wasn't available at the time that we were looking to record. And in all fairness, I mean, this book was published in 2012. So, you know, it's a pretty, it's, it's like a decade old. I, I guess he's, you know, he's done a lot of other things since then. So um, yeah, it's, it's fair that this, this book uh, is, you know, maybe not, uh, not the thing that he wants to talk about right now. Yeah, but having said that, it's a really good book. And it both is of us, a really good book. Um, you know, sometimes we we contact publishers and ask them for uh, review copies of books. But this is a book that both of us have on our shelves that we just got because we thought it was a great book and some time ago. And I uh, thought we'd just record a podcast for it because it's a good story and we think people would like to hear about it. 
Yeah. I mean, it certainly has a great title because running with the Kenyans is definitely something I would have wanted to do. I actually, I had a friend side story. I know Alan already gave his story, but I had a friend in uh, university. So he was on the cross country team with me. Um, his name is Ryan and he um, ended up actually going to Kenya and training for a month in one of the Kenyan training camps. So I, I always thought that was super cool. And like, I remember him planning the trip and Actually, the cost of living once he was there was was not very much. That's why he could stay for a month. What what, what cost a lot of money was actually getting there because he had to fly from you know Canada to Kenya at the time. So this this would have been like maybe I don't know 2013 or thereabouts, and like maybe he was maybe it, I I would kind of have this number in my head that he told me it was like two hundred and fifty dollars for him to like live in this training camp for the month, but the I don't know if that's uh, if that was correct. Is yeah, be. I mean the cost of living there is not not high at all. But mm -hmm. then again, the standard of living is not that high either. If you mm -hmm. know what I mean. As we mm -hmm. found out in this book, so yeah. um, I guess did, did your friend have kids? No, no, he didn't. Yeah, which helps. <laughs> Uh, but and it was only for a month. The Darren went for six months, and he brought his whole family which uh which is pretty impressive so um yeah i guess i guess the way that the book starts is that adaran and uh, talks about how he started running so like he uh because basically it, all of this going to kenya starts because he uh he, you know when he was younger he started running he kind of got distracted when he uh when he got to like later school years like university um so he didn't you know put as much effort into it to see how far he could go he was kind of identified as a you know as a runner by his um, grade school gym teacher so uh he, because they had, had had to run a mile i think and he um he ended up like being the first of his school. So he was kind of identified as a runner. And so he kind of carried that for a while. And uh, then he got distracted. So he didn't run so much. Uh, and he ne then, you know, he's always kind of came back to it. And then uh, now he was, you know, married with kids and kind of wondering where his potential really was and um, decided uh I think after winning a local charity 10K in his area, he decides, he kind of decides that he wants to go and find out why the Kenyans are so good because at this point, they're just kind of sweeping the podiums um, in all the major marathons and he just wants to see like what their secret is. And uh, when he brings it up to his wife, surprisingly, his wife is all on board. She's not even a runner, but she was just kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah, but she's she's an adventurer. I think uh, she likes yeah. to she likes to go, kind of visiting other countries for a long time. I think mm -hmm. uh, Adarian talks about in his book about going to South America. I think with his wife uh, Marietta mm -hmm. and and traveling traveling around and and sort of dipping into other cultures. So I think she's sort of up for that. And his kids are not school age yet at this point. So so Marietta was just like, oh, it's going to be a good learning experience for them. It's good for them to experience different things. That's kind of, for me, the, the big brave thing. If she has small children and she's going to take them to somewhere like Kenya mm -hmm. and go, oh, yes, they'll be fine. <laughs> uh, they'll love it. They'll get all sorts of experiences. And they're prob um, probably they do, but it's quite a brave move because you feel... Like, I don't know, more protective of your children than you would of yourself. You go, yeah. oh, if it sucks, I can deal with it. Um, but if it sucks for your kids, you can't bear for them to have to deal with it almost. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I know um, uh, when we came to Canada, you know, my story was about when my wife and I left. My story was like a statement. It was when my wife and I left the UK to go to Australia. But um, 15 years after that, we had three small children, uh, little Australians, and um, we came to Canada, been here since 2001 in Montreal. So to some extent, French speaking, uh, Quebec with three kids. And the idea of moving the three kids was kind of tough. I mean, we had to spend a lot of time psyching them up. Yeah. I And um, Darren and actually goes through a bit of that because the kids, because they're white, they get kind of like a lot of attention 
and yeah. they don't necessarily enjoy it. And so like they kind of start to withdraw is what he mentions in his book. And he's he starts to like kind of think like, well, did we make a, the right choice? You know, like, was this really a good idea? Like, just because I wanted to, you know, see why these guys run so fast and see if I could run faster by training with them. And he like feels very selfish for that. But, you know, everything kind of ends up working out. And um, it was really cute because it ends up that one of the ladies that uh, I think it's a lady that cleans their house as she brought them to have their hair braided the, the hair extensions or something yeah or... and and this was like for the two girls it was just like a life changer because they thought this experience was fantastic and they like after they got these braids they just went out into the world and like started hanging out with the other kids so much so that sometimes like a darren had no idea like they just mixed in with they all just the wander other off into the village kids. so to speak yeah they, he would have to like go into people's houses and look at, let's see, like if they were sitting on like, you know, other people's sofas and things, he would just like, they would just go off and they made like some friends. And um, so that was really cute that uh, then they just started to, you know, be kids and they had a lot of freedom over there because I guess childhoods are a bit different. Like they're not so like play is not so structured. It's just kind of like the, these big groups of kids and you end up walking into a house and they're like just all sitting on the couch together watching uh, the same program or whatever. So it was really cute that, uh, yeah, all of a sudden it seemed like that was the, that was the defining moment. It was like they, they yeah, got that was sort of transformational and... moment in the book. <laughs> yeah. You sort of worried about the kids and worried whether he's made the right decision and suddenly you go, oh, looks like it's going to be okay. Yeah. So um, I guess before we go into the um, the actual running portion of it, like maybe we should talk a little bit about about when he uh, when he actually made the move and looking for a place to live because it seemed to be a very big difference between, um, I guess, standard of living because over there houses didn't always have running water. Or and there was one house he went to go see. I think it had a, it had running water and it had a, a place in the bathroom with water that would come out for like a bath, but it didn't have a bathtub, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> well, what struck me when they were sort of looking for somewhere to live and. I think where they were intending to go in Iten, the, the house wasn't ready yet. So they had to go to a, like a campsite or something mm -hmm. was everywhere. They went, they'd have some person who they were contacted, who would show them somewhere and say, look how wonderful it is. And yeah, like he would look at it and think, Oh God, it's an absolute slum compared to where I've been sort of thing. But I guess yeah. it is wonderful for where I am now. The sort of Kenyans who were showing him places Either they had a different view of what wonderful was or they were hyping it up, um, probably try to do both. Yeah, I, I'm guessing it's probably more the first thing than the second thing, because like it, if you have, you know, it was not super common to have, you know, houses with plumbing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, he talks about one of the runners who was living in a room, basically, and he would go and get his water at. Um, I don't know, the well or the river or something like so that was, you know, part of the things that he just had to do in normal life is go and get water for drinking and for bathing and that kind of thing. So I think probably it's more that that these places really were wonderful to them because they were like the one of the best, one of the best houses, let's say in the area but there seemed to be a lot of hyping up of all kinds of things, though, when <laughs> he would meet people. It was kind of funny. Yeah, there's a Kenyan word for like white, white people that comes up in the book. I probably pronounce it wrong, but I think it's like Mzungu or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And every time I saw that, I kept thinking of Harry Potter. <laughs> you know, Harry Potter, they have muggles. Yeah. Who are like people who don't who don't know magic in Harry yeah. Potter. And I, every time I see this word Mzungu, I think, oh, it's the Kenyan word for. <laughs> For, for muggles, it's like people who don't know the magic of how to run properly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they all have yeah. the, they all have the magic and he's a and he's a muggle where in fact the, the word Mazungu I think means like white guy or foreigner yeah. or something like that. 
something like that. Yeah. I, and he would be, um, because in races, they would also, they would, they would yell at him like that. He's like the first Muzungu. You're really slow, but your first Muzungu. Yeah. <laughs> and he felt that way too. It, it was, it was interesting. Um, what, one of the things that, uh, Darren Ann talks us to us about in the, in the book is, uh, in London before he goes to Kenya, he, he, he finds a group of Kenyans who are living in London. And they're living together in a in a house. So he, he goes to visit them and have a little run with them to sort of ask them about Kenya and stuff. First of all, they're all sort of just all living in a communal sort of house. And he, what he would consider at the time to be sort of poor circumstances uh, in London. But then he finds out when he's running with them that there are like world champions and ex-world record holders and in this group. And, and that becomes a theme going all the way through, I think, as well. Um, mm-hmm. that you know he keeps bumping into people and um, uh, they have these incredible running records but, but one of the things that struck me was he one of the things he asks them is if he's going to run he's going to Kenya to run with some some Kenyans to, to train with Kenyans um, what's the slowest speed that they, they run at because what you know who are the who are the slowest ones because he figures you know can I keep up with the slowest ones basically yeah and He's quite a good runner himself. Um, I think at the time he had a 38 minute uh, 10K, 10K PR, um, which which we know is pretty respectable. Yeah, we would it like is, to have yeah. that, wouldn't we? Mm-hmm. We would like to run that. And so he he asks these 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 runners while they're jogging, you know, how slow might they, they run? And they said, oh, like for for a 10K, for a 10K race. And they said, oh, we, do you want to count juniors, junior runners? And he says, <laughs> oh yes. And they said, oh, well, the slowest ones would be about 35 minutes. And so he suddenly <laughs> realizes that he's going into a different world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He also, uh, before he leaves, he, um, because this is like in the years when they started with the whole barefoot running movement because of born to run born to run was released like a few years before and now Mm -hmm. like all the running stores are flooded with information about barefoot running and you know you have these like barefoot running experts and uh, people wanting you to run in in vivo shoes and so anyway he's told or I guess you know because he read born to run he's probably kind of convinced that he needs to be able to run barefoot to run well Um, and he finds this sort of person to retrain his running style So he kind of does this, which means he decreases his mileage a lot. And part of the reason why he does that was because he believed that the Kenyans, that one of the reasons the Kenyans are so good is because they, you know, they grow up without shoes. And so he thought that's probably one of the reasons why they're so good is because they run barefoot um, or they run always in racing flats is the other thing that he thought uh, before he went there. And uh, so he he hires this guy to retrain his running, but he has to decrease his mileage a lot because the idea is that um, he shouldn't be running with bad form at all in order to retrain his, his, uh, his way of running. So that means because he can only really sustain his new form for a certain amount of time, he ends up running a lot less before he goes. So he's a little bit less fit when he gets to Kenya as well because of that. Yeah. And one of the things that shocks him is when he gets there and he sees some runners, they're all running in running shoes. Mm -hmm. And they're all heel heel striking. That was one of the things in the book that kind of stood out to him at first. He's like, oh, they're all heel heel striking. (laughs) Yes. So so they all have not necessarily good form um, Mm -hmm. and they're certainly not running barefoot. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so that was sort of like, oh, I guess that's not, uh, not one of their secrets. And the book kind of uh, seems to seems to be like that, like, there's a lot of points where he sort of asks people what, what they think the secret is, why are Kenyans so good? And he gets all these different answers. And then sometimes what he'll do is he'll ask a second person, oh, do you think this is why the Kenyan runners are so good? Like he asked the question, to one of the Kenyans, do you think that Kenyan runners are really good because you grow up without shoes or like you you run without shoes? And he says, no. <laughs> yeah, and then throughout the book, there's this question, is it this, is it that, is it that? Uh, as, as you might anticipate, I think there's no one 
specific answer. I mean, that would have been discovered ages ago and everybody would be doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's probably a complicated combination of things. Yeah. I guess we should talk about um, when he gets there. So like how he ends up finding a training group. Yeah. To begin with, um, to begin with, he, he doesn't really know, well, how, how's he going to run with people? You know, we we saw in the the book on the with Michael Crawley uh, about the Ethiopians, is he just went to the park and just stood around, and uh, people came by in a group and said, "Hey, why are you running on your own? Get in the group." They just kind of yeah. like just pulled him into a group. It seemed like with the Kenyans, you had to sort of know somebody and know what was going on and know where to go at what time. There seemed to be like a training group that's meeting on the street corner. Mm -hmm. You usually at some really early hour in the morning well really early for me it was probably normal for you Liz <laughs> but it seemed to be that you know they were often it was always at 6 a.m <laughs> yeah they were often running at 6 a.m which means you got to get up at 4 30 a.m or something like that so a, no a normal training day for you but except did you notice the that middle the of Kenyans, the night for me the Kenyans didn't get up at 4 30 in the morning they'd get up at like 5 30 they'd kind of roll out of bed and then just end up on the street corner uh, I never noticed that. No, uh, I I think I I think like the first some thing of the they times, do is run. Yeah, there was there was this one there was this one um, place in the book where he talks about like because he's with others in a sort of training camp environment, and they all put their alarm clocks for like pretty close to the six a.m. and but then they're gone out for running and at six a.m. So I want to say it was five thirty. Like they all set their alarm clocks for 530. So basically they're just like getting dressed that, and then they go for the run. So um, yeah, they don't, they don't get up like, I mean, 530 is early to get up, but they don't get up like in the middle of the night so that they could eat three hours before and digest their food and all that. They sleep until the last minute. Good, good man. Maybe I'll have some Kenyan blood. <laughs> That's what I mean, it don't is. Don't do that before a marathon, like before a marathon you need to get up three hours before and stuff. One of the things we notice is that every time he picks up with a group, a casual training group, there's always some phenomenal runner, like gold med Olympic gold medalist or, uh, um, so they live in really basic circumstances. It seems, although if they've had some success, they seem to own cows or a house or something that they bought with their winnings of their money. And they just sort of near the front of the group and, you know, suddenly it'll be, you know, Wilson Kipsang, the Olympic gold medalist at 10,000 meters or whatever it is um, in, in amongst all the people who are aspiring to do that one day, um, get invited to a race uh, overseas. And there just seems to be a series of these groups. Uh, they don't, they don't seem to be um, like super formalized, although then he finds um, trainers and in particular one trainer, uh, who's quite well known now, uh, brother Com, um, mm -hmm. who trains people very specifically, uh, in, in a team and has produced you know, a lot of world record holders and, and Olympic medalists, um, winners of huge runs, etc. And he talk, he eventually talks, talks to those people about what are the secrets of the Kenyans as well. And we'll come to that, but eventually he decides that well, he'd start his own training group and yeah. he'll get a, he get a few people together and enter a, a main character in the book, Godfrey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Godfrey seems to be quite the character because sometimes like you're not really sure if he's going to come through. <laughs> he he seems like a bit of a shady character sometimes, but like. Like he's not, he's not telling you everything that's going on and there's always some delay with some excuse. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but everything seems to kind of work out. He also um, kind of uh, just seems to push for certain people to join the training group that just like seem kind of random, but it, it all kind of turns out pretty well in the end, I'd say, um, because he, there's, a, there's a girl, I think her name was Beatrice. Yes. She, she believes that I don't remember what the exact time is, but she keeps uh, she believes that she's like a 70 minute half marathoner or 75 minute half marathoner. But like when he when she runs with uh, a Darren and he's like 
kind of always smoking her at the end of the training. Yeah, because... or she drops out because she gets too tired or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And so it was pretty interesting to to kind of see that. And um, I guess we'll we'll tell you what happened at the actual uh, goal race. So they plan yeah. this goal race. So basically the idea is that he puts together this team and they're all going to train for the Lua Marathon. Yeah. Uh, and the Lua Marathon is uh, not known to be like a really fast course because it's it sounded like it was a bit of a trail marathon. Yeah, sort of hilly. and It was hilly, yeah. Uh, dirt roads and single track section, I think there was. So, um, but I don't know why they chose that race, but they chose that race. The idea was that uh, Adaranad wanted to have a training cycle with a group and then go do this race. And uh, hopefully, you know, he's a changed runner. Yeah. yeah. And and um, how does he attract people to, to the, um, to his team? I think he ends up calling them. I mean, they're by this time they're, they're now installed in Iten. Mm-hmm. The, the the famous village where all the fast runners come from, and he decides he's going to call his team. Oh, I forget the name, but it's like the Iten Town Harriers, wasn't? I think it was kind of named after his his team back in the UK. No, he was yeah, because like, um... often often the running clubs in the UK are called Harriers. He, he has the Iten Harriers, and he attracts people by saying he'll pay their entry fees, which is huge for the Kenyans. Mm-hmm. They don't have to pay their entry fee. So, and of course they figure, great, we're going to be in, we'll be in this and then we'll win. They all seem to think they're going to win. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a recurring fantastic positivity. We'll enter. That's excellent. I I don't have to find the fee. Then I'll win. Then I'll get invited to a race overseas. Then I'll win that. And now I'm made for life Mm -hmm. because the money that I get from an overseas race will pay for the rest of my life, basically. Yeah, basically what they do then is they all seem to like the first thing they buy when they have race winnings is a cow, it seems like, um, because it seems like a cow will kind of set your family up for, um, you know, not uh, missing out on food, yeah, and it's I guess. Kind, of, kind of a status symbol if you have a cow. Yeah, it seems to be. They'll buy land and a cow and uh, their whole family will be good for life kind of thing. I mean, there's an observation that that um, Adaranan makes with respect to Kenyans having sometimes very short careers because they're driven basically to win a race overseas and get some prize money, which for them, you know, it could be substantial for, for a, a person in the Western world, but it's, you know, absolute life-changing money um for for a kenyan back in kenya because the cost of mm-hmm. living is so low there his observation is that once they win some money they lose focus yeah because they're not driven anymore to change their lives because their lives change in- instantaneously when they win once yes yeah and he mentions also what ends up happening is after they win they don't um they don't stay at the training camps as so uh, you know, they kind of, they, they want to just keep on training, but outside, like, you know, living with their families and running their now new businesses or or whatever they ended up setting up with the prize money that they got. And then they end up being, that's kind of how they lose focus. So um, I guess just as an aside, Elliot Kipchoge, I mean, when he's been interviewed, he, um, he always goes to the training, like he always trains with the training camp. And I guess that's probably why it's yeah. like, so that he's not distracted. Yeah. And he talks about discipline and focus and sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, basically if you're in a camp, you're living in a very basic way, you're training, you're resting, you're eating. There's not much else to do. No, um, they do chores. From what I saw from yeah. a video that I watched, they, they, I mean, cause they maintain yeah. the camp themselves. So they're, you know, you'll have like the, the world record holder will scrub toilets when it's his turn. Yeah. But they don't have like a family life. It, it seems. No, everything revolves around training. So initially when uh, Adaranand runs with these groups, he tries to stay with the women, but even them, then they're often too fast for him. Yeah. So he's getting dropped off all the time. Yeah. And oftentimes, um, so, so what was interesting was that the long run always had somebody following in a, in a van of some sort, like a van or a pickup truck or something with the water. So they don't, um, they don't carry their water with them for the run. They have somebody that that'll be like at certain points with water bottles, but then it means the, 
the runners can't string out too much because otherwise it's impossible for the for the water car or truck to, to sort them. of to service everybody. Yeah. So um a lot of times Adaranan drops out of his long run because he's like gotten so far behind. And you see that that's kind of a that just seems to be kind of the way to do things um in like for Kenyan runners. They don't sort of seem to just you know, drive themselves until they're kind of, you know, just shuffling along because they're so tired. If they're, if they fall off pace too much and they're too far behind, it seems like they always just drop out. Like they'll yeah, get they in the car. Yeah, they just hop in the van. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's kind of interesting because like they train super hard, but it seems like, you know, in some instances, you know, they sort of know when to drop out or seem to. Yeah, he'll go out for a for a run with his newly formed team and then they'll decide they're going to run 30k long run. Mm-hmm. And maybe only two of them will end up doing the 30k and the other ones will just go, oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They'll wasn't eventually... feeling it or yeah. couldn't keep the pace. So I just threw it in. And uh Darren Ann ends up some of the runs, he ends up cutting them at 15k. So he only really did half. Because because that's how fast his training partners are, I guess. He gets too far behind. Even the um even the women. Um there's a cross country race um that he manages to get an invite to. I think it's in Iten. He enters this cross country race and I think it's several laps and he ends up getting lapped. Mm-hmm. Because when it when the race goes off, lots of the Kenyans try to go fast from the start and run from the front. And often, as we've sort of referred to, they can't sustain the pace, but they don't care. They're, they're, they, they figure that one day they will, um, and mm-hmm. maybe this will be the day. So they go for it, and um, you know, l- lots of them end up dropping out, but they all seem to believe in themselves. Eventually, they're going to make it. Eventually, they're going to be able to run these incredible paces, and yeah. you know, and sometimes they do, and maybe only once. Um, but that's all they need. So, so they have this sort of different, I think, approach to their to their running. Yeah, and it it's um you know Adarnan goes there to find the secret of Kenyan running, but whenever he's asking people what they think the secret is, it's like as if they they don't really have an answer prepared because it's almost as if they don't really they've never really thought about it. They never really thought there was any secret, and so they all give him different answers, and even there's uh uh one time he it might have been he was talking with i think it was he was talking with godfrey and um because godfrey would run to school when he was when he was a kid so he asked godfrey well why do kids run to school and um like Godfrey said, though, well, there are different reasons. Like some kids run, like not to be late is is very important yeah. because they get punished if they're late. So they try not to be late. But it seemed like he had this enlightening moment as well because he, he said like, well, I found that when I ran to school, I was more uh, like alert and attentive to like my schooling. And so he kind of, but he, it was as if like, he just discovered this about himself. Like he kind of, you know, he kind of like was pondering it and was like, like thinking about it for the first time. Yeah. It was like the first time he was thinking about it, which is interesting. And um, one of the other challenges that Darren and had was just because a lot of the Kenyans are very shy. Like they're not used to being in the spotlight because they're very much, you know, they, they're very community oriented more than sort of individual family units it's sort of like you live in a community and it was really interesting because he met Mary Ketani who like Mary Ketani is a fantastic female runner like I think she won New York several times yeah Yeah, I mean like I have watched her win many like many races (laughs) on uh, on YouTube so she she's she's a fantastic runner and she was like super shy when Adarina met her like so shy that she, you know, he he was in her house to meet her. And I think like she didn't even look at him because she was so shy and she barely talked to him. And um, whenever you'd ask her a question, she would kind of like smile and look away and <laughs> which was kind of awkward for a Darren and but um, 
Yeah, it's kind of strange because yeah, everybody, everybody especially the, the the girls, are difficult to talk to because they're super super shy. But then you get into a race, and then there's lots of them who are like they really believe in themselves, and they're running really hard at the front, or they want to believe in themselves. I think. Mm -hmm. And you always think, uh, from our perspective in the Western world, you always think of that as sort of a certain arrogance, and you'd expect people to be, I don't know, outgoing who will had that attitude to their run. But in fact, it's not necessarily mm -hmm. the case. W one of the things that um, Adaranand, I think it's again, it's Godfrey. Um, Adaranand gets his information from Godfrey is that he realizes that all the kids running to school and stuff, they're laying down a, a base sort of aerobic base of years and years before mm -hmm. they even get to trying to be runners and whereas in the western world if you start doing running you start i don't know as a teenager trying to to run and then do a training program by the time kenyans are 16 they've already laid down years and years of aerobic uh, base training mm -hmm. without realizing it and without without any real structure, just they just, you know, that's how they get to school. And sometimes the school is far, like they might be five years old and run five kilometers each way because because it's faster than walking is basically yeah. the reason it's not there's nothing, nothing more to it than that. And and there are masses and masses of the population who are like that. So whereas in the Western world, we're selecting a few people to try to develop their running from teenagers upwards. In Kenya, there's a massive population already with aerobic base. Um, so they can see who could be the, the good runners. And so they've got a much better selection process for runners as well as anything else. Mm -hmm. They also have a much better structure because, you know, all of these um, sort of, they seem random to us like these training groups that turn up at you know 6 a.m or whatever but they're very accessible because anyone can just show up uh yeah. so so you know it like reduces the barrier to entry really because if you wanted to train like there's there are groups they just they show up on a street corner and you just you go for a run um and you know like there will be a there will be a, a workout to do uh, uh like the one that he mentioned at one point was uh 25 times one minute on one minute off like just like one minute fast one minute jog i mean that's a really long session i think so or maybe it's i guess it's a it's a little more than an hour but uh yeah so you just show up uh the the other thing is that um it, it seems like to be a runner uh it is very much a, an acceptable life goal like if you you if you're a Kenyan yeah. child and you tell your parents that you're, you, you want to be a runner, they will, um, they will support you. Yeah. It's kind of seen as a, as a, as, as a noble profession to want to be a runner. You know, it's a bit like, you know, if you were, if you were in the Western world and your parents say, oh, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? If you say, well, I want to be a rock star or yeah. uh, I want to be a footballer or something like that. They'll say, okay, as long as you also get an education, but that's yeah. not the case in, you can, you can, to dedicate your life to a sport in Kenya is, um, is okay. And the parents will, you know, I mean, not that they have, uh, not that they have like big budgets or anything, but, you know, if parents can help their kids um, and pay rent or what they, they will do it because, if their child ends up winning prize money at one of these races, well, they also share with the family, you know, so it's kind of like it's an investment in the in the family. And um, I think, you know, a lot of times like the prize money does go, you know, comes back to the community as well. Yeah, we saw we saw that with uh, with Beatrice, the the girl in the uh, in Ad Adaranan's um, running team mm -hmm. um, who just jumping forward a little bit it ends up having a really good run in in the um the Lua marathon and i think she comes fourth i guess that's fourth woman yeah fourth woman and she gets uh she gets some prize money for that uh, the prize money doesn't seem to be that much but then when you when Darren Ann analyzes it he says it's probably enough for about 3 years rent so yeah it's it's very lucrative um yeah 
And I think he asks her at one stage near the end of the book what she did with the money. And she said she bought a TV, She, which is a you know, phen phenomenal thing to be able to do. She bought a yeah. TV. She paid her rent for six months. And she gave the rest of her money to her mom. Yeah. Because that's kind of what children do. They look after their families. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I guess parents are saying, well, okay, we'll try to invest and uh, it's part of an investment in our security as well to support one of our children to be a runner. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's pretty interesting. I and I think um, you know, that's uh, probably one of their secrets. Um, I mean, they don't mention that in the book because the book, in terms of uh, in terms of like finally, what did Darren and find out were their secrets? It seems to be like there was no real conclusion. Um, but I guess like. From my perspective, I mean, I think probably the fact that they, you know, you mentioned they run, they, that they create their aerobic base without even knowing it. Well, that's definitely an advantage. But then there's also, uh, you know, they have a community of people to run with and they have a community that supports their running. So they have a whole culture around running. I mean, that definitely helps, I think. They're training at altitude because it tends at altitude on a plateau. Mm-hmm. But there are lots of villages um, that are potentially um, at altitude as well and are in Kenya. Um, mm -hmm. But Iten is super famous and uh, lots and lots of record holders come from there. And I think Adaranand attributes that a little bit to the um, training and and, uh, and training camps of uh, Brother Calm, mm -hmm. who seems to be almost sort of legendary in Iten in terms of if you get into one of his camps, you're going to break world records or win medals. Um, so there's obviously something, either he's very good at choosing people or there's something additional that he does in his training camps, which might just be focus and discipline that allows yeah. the average really good Kenyan to become an excellent world-class Kenyan. Mm -hmm. I guess we should talk about what ended up happening in the Lua Marathon. Yeah, because that's that's kind of one of the um, things that it builds up to in the camp. Mm -hmm. uh, he he ends up forming a a, a group, um, and you get introduced to the runners that Godfrey is his coach uh, and, and yeah. sort of mentor. And Godfrey Godfrey to like pushes him to accept certain runners, and yeah. just when he thought that that was going to be it for the training group, he like. Um, wants like one extra one here and there always to be joined in, to yeah, join for in. some dubious reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so he ends up with, I think about six people, something like that. One female Beatrice. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked, there's this one character, Jeff Fett. I don't know yeah. if I'm even uh, saying his name right, but he's um, he's the one that, um, you know, Darren Ann goes to visit at his home and his home is like, well, there's no running water. He goes and he he fills jugs up at the river to bring back home. And that's like for drinking water. And and when it's raining, um, they like he'll he'll collect the rainwater. So that way he doesn't have to go like to the river with his jugs, which, um, yeah, it makes you appreciate water a lot more. Yeah, a sort of a poorer background than some of the others, I think. Mm -hmm. He has like these really old training shoes that he runs with. And at the time when he when uh, Darren Ann meets Jeffett in Kenya, he's it seems like he's very injury prone, like he's always injured. But uh, he doesn't he does end up making it to the Lua Marathon. And um, yeah, he he's also one of the ones like even even if he's injured, he believes that his next big break is just around the corner. Yeah, they also one of the things that goes all, all the way through the book, they all seem to have a fantastic um, uh, positivity, uh, given how much they don't have really. Uh, they're all super positive about they're going to their, their next big break is just around the corner, as you said. Yeah. Um. So so Beatrice wins some prize money. Um. Yeah, Jeff yet also wins a prize and he eventually gets um the chance to compete abroad. Yeah, which is what the, which is what all Kenyans are are really angling for to get a um an overseas trip to win some serious prize money in a overseas event. Exactly. So he um but the, but the overseas um competition that doesn't happen until a Darren is is back in the UK. But he ends ends up meeting 
uh, Jafet at the airport and Beatrice was also supposed to be there but apparently like she couldn't get a visa in time and it just seems like everything kind of is a little uh up in the air but um I think Godfrey calls Adarnand to try to accelerate some things so Jafet can get his visa or something because there's sort of a panic mm -hmm. on and similarly for Beatrice but they were they're unable to get a, a visa for Beatrice so Jafet goes yeah. out to to run in the Netherlands, I think it is, the Utrecht yes. uh, marathon, and Beatrice doesn't. Yeah, but Darren Ann meets Jafet at the airport, and um, the poor guy, like, he ends up being uh, kind of, like, picked up by security or something, and um, and he tries to explain that he's there to run the marathon and shows his, like, beat-up running shoes, but he only, he got, just gets off the plane, he has a little backpack with like the clothes he's wearing and his shoes in the backpack like, like he has nothing and and so even just to run he has no running kit and he's wearing his jeans and so um uh he ends up like Darren Ann kind of takes care of him and um yeah they go off and get him like a sort of a spot a little sponsorship from Brooks who yeah. gave him a whole bunch of equipment yeah Brooks gave him running kit and um so at least, you know, he could line up with running kit, but he still didn't have any warm up pants. So he was warming up in his jeans. Yeah. But, and then he, and then he, and then he goes off and, and wins something. I think he, he does he places or something in the Utrecht marathon. Yeah. He, he places uh, high enough to get prize money. So he's very happy with that. I, I was really sad for Beatrice because like, I liked her. I think because she was the only woman in the group, like I yeah. had a soft spot for her. And because like, I thought it was so spectacular how the whole time, like all the training runs, she just seemed to like, just always be falling off the back, like not really completing many of them. And then she goes and um, during the marathon, like a Darren and is sort of like, expecting to pick her off around halfway. Yeah, because the Darren and runs the marathon as well, doesn't he? And he finds it very tough. He does. Yeah, he ends up like he he runs out and He's doing pretty well at the beginning, but it's very hilly. And I don't know if he was expecting that. Like, I suspect he wasn't really expecting it to be that hilly and and trail-y because it seems like he's uh, feeling strong. But I, I don't know. His description is very much that uh, he's going up hills a lot <laughs> in the first half. And then it's like two loops, I think. So the second loop, he had a really hard time and he slowed down a lot. But he was expecting that that he would eventually um, pick up Beatrice because that's what always happened in training was that like eventually would kind of catch up to her. And um, I think he sees her. Um, and then there are some other women in the race that, that catch up to Beatrice and he figures, oh no, like that's going to be the end of it. But no, Beatrice sticks with them and just like comes through at the end. So that was pretty, I, I was like, I was pr pretty happy for her. I think the thing that, that that struck me about Beatrice is great that she won prize money at the Lua Marathon, but what could have happened to her life if she'd gotten her visa to go to Utrecht? You know, maybe she would have, I don't know, podiumed for the ladies or something, and then suddenly she's an international Kenyan runner, and her life and her family's life would have been entirely different, absolutely transformed, and all because of some bureaucracy in Kenya, they can't get visas through you know, yeah. government offices and time and stuff like that. It's kind of terrible. It is. Yeah. So um, so I guess what happened to Adarnand after he uh, left Kenya because he ran the Lua Marathon, he wasn't too, too happy with it because, well, he kind of died at the end and the time wasn't as spectacular as he had hoped for. Um, and also it was hot. So this marathon was like hot, hilly and... Uh, and a lot of trail. Yeah, and I think he was pretty disappointed with his with his effort. But then all the Godfrey and uh, all the other people saying, "Yeah, but you did really well. You were first Mazunga." Yeah, Mazungu, Mazungu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were all pretty proud of him, but he was kind of disappointed. Um, but when he got home, that's when the magic started to happen because he entered another marathon because he felt really fit. And he ended up yeah. running, drum Two, roll please. 255. Yeah, which was the goal that he had for Lua. He wanted to run sub three. 
but it didn't happen there. But it happened after he got back. He also ran another 10K. Yeah. And he ran sub three, sub 36. Yes. So he was officially fast enough to train with the Kenyans, the slowest Kenyans in Kenya now, but he was back home. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that was a good ending because he came away from the Lua Marathon a bit disappointed and wondering whether it was worth it all this training that he'd done all the difficulties that he'd been through and all the ups and downs um the family you know like the kids that he brought over but then when he got back he realized uh from a running point of view he changed level yeah by a lot maybe we should give our opinions that's that's kind of it in terms of the story so we, we both took this book on um not by you and i sort of agreeing so much as just both of us thought it was a good book and we went out and read it. So maybe we should just give our comments overall for the book for anybody who might be interested in reading it. Sure. Well, just general comments from me. Uh, it was a good insight into Kenyan running, but it's also a good, great adventure story as well in terms of you know going off into the unknown and discovering uh, new countries and culture. We know there are no shortcuts in terms of, um, you know, magic source to, to to running but it's interesting to see all the speculation around why kenyans are so good and i think we we end up getting a whole series of things that probably contribute you know training or diet we never talked about all the ugali that they eat mm-hmm. they love ugali um and eat a lot of that as i said before a daranand is a mazungu in kenya um term for stranger or white person um and you know it reminded me of harry potter and him being a muggle and not understanding the magic that the kenyans uh understand so that was kind of a fun aspect there were no pictures or episode titles in the book you know they're not certainly the version that i read it was like a very simple novel format actually i think the cover was probably the uk cover because my sister in the uk sent it to me there was nothing fancy about the actual format. It was a, just a standard novel. So um, it would have been nice to have some pictures of, of Jafet or uh, Beatrice or the house where Adaranan lived, his kids with braids in their hair and, and things like that. So uh, it's kind of sad that we didn't have that. But, you know, the story is a fantastic one. Yeah, I I was, uh, I guess I'll um, just start off by saying with a, title like running with the kenyans discovering the secrets of the fastest people on earth i was waiting for a bombshell running secret it seemed like uh, there were no secrets but in reality there were many secrets um you just can't bottle them up and sell them so i guess i came away with that you know it's important to pay attention to the basics like sleep and focus and nutrition um we didn't talk about it like alan said but uh, they eat they eat a lot of carbs. So basically their diet is, is mainly carbohydrate. And, um, you know, now that we've read a lot of other books, we know that that's kind of a trend with, um, with high level endurance athletes, when you're training at a high level in endurance sport, you need a lot of carbs. I found that this was an engaging read. Darren and was able to mix his own running journey with the stories of many other runners that he met during his six months in Kenya. Uh, The story was balanced, so the move to Kenya was not always easy with the small kids, and the book covered this aspect as well. It was not just a romanticized story of moving to Kenya and getting faster. It was um, he tried to to balance it out, like he he told it how it was, and you know mentioned that on his side he had to kind of um, get used to certain things, maybe downgrade his expectations of living conditions and those kinds of things as well. Uh, compared to the UK. Um, I would recommend this to anyone that wants to learn about Kenyan running culture. I mean, I loved it. I thought it was a great read and I'm glad I finally got to read it because it's been on my list for a long time. Yeah, it's a good story and it reinforces the sort of basic disciplines that you need to be an endurance runner. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of those disciplines are kind of built into Kenyan culture. That's to some extent why we see what we see in terms of Kenyan dominant Kenyan dominance in running. Mm-hmm. So thank you for listening to another episode of Running Book Reviews. Big thanks to our teammate Margarita for giving me a copy of this book, and to Alan's sister in the UK who sent him his copy. 
If you would like to leave us feedback about how we can improve the podcast or want to suggest a book that you would like for us to review in a future episode, please leave us a comment on social media. We are Running Book Reviews on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. Please also follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they're released or you can just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. If you've been listening to us for a while and are wondering how you can help us out, there are a few ways. If you enjoy the podcast, spread the word. Tell your friends about us or share a link to your favorite episode with a running partner. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if this is how you listen to the podcast. You can also rate us out of five stars on Spotify. We're now on Buy Me a Coffee where you can buy us a coffee as well. Or you can just um, follow us on Buy Me a Coffee and um, see the occasional extras that we um, that we put out. Probably we should just mention while we're talking about Buy Me a Coffee for people who are listening to the podcast on uh, a streaming platform and haven't gone to buy me a coffee and might be wondering how we went at our um, sub three hour attempt um, if you go to buy me a coffee the story's there a written story and uh, uh, quite a bit of chat between Liz and I on uh, our efforts at the Toronto Marathon we haven't written a book about it yet so we didn't do it extensively on running book reviews <laughs> bye for now bye